to, to, to meet really, really smart people and, and discover really interesting things that they do. Uh, my latest handle is Principal API Architect for Layer 7 Technologies, which uh, I just joined starting this summer. It's a very cool organization. Again, it's very, very smart people doing some very cool work. Uh, I'm just very lucky to be uh, a part of that group. And they're focusing on uh, lots of spaces, but the area that I'm focusing on is API, and API design, and web uh, architecture. So uh, I get to do more of that, and that's pretty cool. All right, so. Having said that, let's get started. See if we recognize the first one. <laughs> you keep using that word, rest, and I do not think it means what you think it means. Right? In Eagle Hunt, right? So very often we do this. We talk about this four-letter word. Right? And we have an idea in our head of what that means. Some of us that idea is very, very close to that 10-year-old dissertation that actually identified it and named it and created it. Some of us is not so close. Some of us know we're not close and we don't want to be close because they're not interested in a dissertation. But we use that word. So words are powerful. Words matter. And if people do not think it means what you think it means, you're in trouble. Whether you're talking to you know, a room of people like this, you're talking to your peers, you're talking to a development team, you're talking to a client. So it's really important to make sure we decide what we want to do here. Many of us want to talk about HTTP web ar architecture. There's too many letters, so we pick four. We say we're going to talk about REST. Many of us want to talk about our HTTP API. But we're not sure that anybody's going to be interested in using our library. So we add four letters to it. And we say that our API is RESTful, or our framework is RESTful. Right? It helps, it's nice, but in the end, it sucks. Uh, Martin Fowler has a great uh, uh, blog post. Martin's always talking about naming. Like, Martin finds a pattern and names it all the time. Martin Fowler, the uh, Blicky, right? I think is what he calls his, his blog wiki, right? And he's got this great story. I don't have the details in my, all in my head, but basically he says naming is bad. And he picks on Agile for this in a particular case, but you could put rest here in this word. The problem with that, the word Agile, is everybody would like to be that. That's a positive word. That's a cool word. So people will attach it to whatever they're interested in. And of course, that happens with us in rest, right? People want to be restful, so they'll attach it to things. Not because they're trying to lie to anybody, but it's just because they want to be part of the club. Um, and Martin picks out a great example, uh, the, the guy who came up with this new programming method and he decided to call it extreme programming. And one of the reasons he picked that word is because he figured nobody else would steal that word. Nobody wants to be extreme but me, right? So it's like sort of like ownership and branding. So it's important um, that we not try to redefine this term. It's important that we speak clearly about what we want to talk about and not use a meme in order to get somewhere where we're probably not going to like where we end up. If I tell you something and I mean one thing and you think it means another, one of us is going to be pissed. And that's called rest discuss. There's <laughs> another one that I see a lot. Crud all the system. Right? And this is another common pattern. Like people say, oh yeah, what we're gonna do is we gotta, we're, gonna, we're gonna make it crud. Everything's crud. If you think about what we need to do, and we have a problem, we have a, uh, like a problem domain, a problem we have to solve, we're gonna have to map it to this thing called HTTP. That's what we do. That's like what we get paid to do, right? Well, no, 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 I, can have to, I know how to do that with HTTP. And a resource and a couple of URIs, and I get a couple of bodies. Like we're mapping the problem to this limited protocol. And it's a freaking limited protocol, right? It's like you can only do X number of functions. The entire planet is only allowed to do X number of functions for any possible problem in the universe. You can only use, there's 10, but we only think of four, right? And the arguments are totally fixed. The arguments are well, an array of crap on the top and one big blob of something. You cannot make up new arguments, that's it. Four functions, two arguments, go. And so people say, oh, shit, that's crazy. So we'll just credit the systems, right? So we'll just make everything the same. 
because it's too hard to vary all of that. So we apply certain meanings to certain functions, and we go ahead and use mostly you know the, the two arguments we have, you know, as simply as we can. The problem is create, read, update, delete <laughs> is a very limited world. It's even more limited than HTTP. So if we constantly try to map our problem domain just to this, we're always going to have outliers. What do I do with reports? What do I do with computation? What do I do with, with uh, search uh, payloads that are really big? All these things start to fall apart if we try to create this very narrow space. So just saying cut all the systems doesn't really work. And primarily, it's because the CRUD model is based on object thing, right? Because I've got an object, I can do things with it. The problem we have is HTTP was not designed with the thought of objects in mind. So that's another, uh, it's another sort of uh, mismatch, right? It's another uh, disconnect, it's another dissonance when you're trying to map a problem to me. So you've got a problem matching it to a protocol, now you're going to match it to a protocol using a specific style, which means everything has to be create, read, update, delete action. So you're really making it a smaller and smaller universe, and it limits not just functionality, it limits creativity. Right? And I don't think we need to do that. So, the next one is, why do you know who moves hypermedia? So that's like the biggest thing now, right? And I, I feel partly responsible for this problem. Uh, hypermedia, 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 all the systems. Um, so a lot of times what we say is, how come you're not using hypermedia? Well, most people say because I don't know what the hell it is. Right? There's lots of reasoning behind it. The thing is, this hypermedia constraint, this notion of having a control in the response message, not just data in the message, but actually information in the message about what you can do next is totally unique to Fielding's style. If you look at C2, you look at all the other architectural styles that came before his, no one included the notion of these affordances inside the response. So if we're going to talk about REST at all, if we ignore this one, we're ignoring probably the, the biggest creative invention that Fielding put into that silly dissertation. So it's worth thinking about that and talking about that. Um, Fielding actually wrote a very good blog post where he explains what he meant by that phrase in the dissertation. That phrase in the dissertation that was never explained in the dissertation, even though he promises to do that in the text that he never and he's confided in a couple of people that he actually regrets not including that information. He had a whole other section of the dissertation that he had to leave out because of time. And that's what this blog post is from 2008. Who knows the name? Hypertext, uh, 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 REST APIs must be hypertext driven. All right? So that's, that's basically a quick summary of the section of his dissertation that he left out. It's worth reading. It was actually the motivation uh, for the book I wrote on building hypermedia APIs. So use it. If you're gonna if, if you're gonna be in REST, use it. If you're not sure how to use it, read Fielding's blog post. If you're not sure about that, talk to people and use it. It's really, really powerful. We'll, we'll talk about more of that more all, all week, but I just want to point that out. So I had this exact conversation today with Pat. So you say stateless, and people are basically like this. They're like, what are you, Yoda? I don't know what stateless means. What is stateless? How do I be stateless? Right? Probably one of the best explanations of stateless that I heard that's sort of outside our domain is in uh, coin toss, right? We all know about averaging in coin toss and heads and tails. And it's, uh, we all know that there's an average, that things sort of level out over time. But what somebody pointed out to me is, some, you have a phrase that says, you know, if, if I flip five heads in a row, it's more likely to be tails next time. That's a lie. It's not more likely. The coin does not have memory. The coin doesn't remember that it did five heads the first time and now it's time to use right? That's stateless. Right? Stateless is just a, a, a way thing, the way things work. It's a, it's a result of things, right? So it's important to be stateless. It's a, it's a very essential aspect of what we do, 
And I, I give people some really easy ways to explain this. Are you using a session uh, object? If you, if you deliver this to another server, like if you're in a server farm, you have Affinity turned on, does it have to go back to the same server? Can I store this message and open it up tomorrow and deliver the same request and get relatively the same results? If I, don't, if I can't answer yes to those questions, it's not stateless. And it turns out, most of us don't work in stateless work, right? We always, all our tools teach us to turn on session state. And we just learn to live with that. We learn to grow on that. Every time I, I set up a tool, I turn off session. This is another one I really like. One does not simply publish an API. So, so many people do this. I see this way too often. What they do is they've got this, uh, this component library and they just point to it. Or they, they say, I've got a SQL table, point to it. Right? That's not an API. That's, that's, that's basically, or you might think of it as that's a Walmart API or something. I don't know, I don't know what you'd say, but it's, it, there's nothing created there, right? It's just exposing your underbelly. Basically, it's showing me your underbelly. Right? I don't want to see this. I want to know that you spend some time to design an interface. And I want to know that you design that interface appropriately. If it's an interface for a human user, that better be an interface for an API that expects users to interact with it. If it's an interface for machines, do not give me an API for the browser. I want to know you've designed the interface to be appropriate. Donald Norman would have a field day on all of us. User experience rules work here as well, right? The API, the application programming interface, is how you look at the world, is how the world sees you. And that needs to be designed. It needs to be usable. It doesn't need to be intimidating. One of the first things I see, if I see a list of 75 URLs, that's the equivalent of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, like the airline cockpit with 75,000 knobs on it. How do I fly this plane? Right? Donald Norman would kill me if I designed that interface. That's the equivalent of putting every possible link in this application that you can visit all on the landing page and telling a user, go. Oh, that's not an interface. That's a mess. So uh, what I usually tell people, insert your item here. Your object model is not your resource model. Your storage model is not your resource model. Your file system is not your resource model. Right? Design your interface. Use the same care and attention for APIs that you would for a user interface. All right, so you're all Neo. And I'm telling you, there is no spell. There are no versions. What, just think for a minute, what would the world be like if there were no versions? What version of human are you? Are you the same version you were yesterday? Is that rock, is that tree got a version number on it? All the things we interact with every day change every single day. Parts are gone, I've got marks on me, my dog gets older, Furniture breaks. Those aren't versions. Those are evolutions. And yet, at the detailist level, that's a new thing every day. But we don't think about it like that, right? We have this sort of covering thing. That's Sam. I know that's Sam. Sam does not look at all to me like he did when I saw him on stage about like seven or eight years ago. But I know that's Sam. That's a different Sam, but it's Sam. And Sam doesn't have to tell me what version he is for me to talk to him. Right? HTML doesn't have versions on the public web. It's HTML. Okay, marquee things don't work anymore for most browsers, right? But I can still run HTML from 20 years ago. Versions make a lot of sense when you're closely coupled and local. Right? When I write my components, they all have version numbers on them. Because I've got to bind them to lots of other things. But I don't expose that underwear to the public space. Right? My API is my API. I make a guarantee. You, go, you come to my API, and five years ago I said you could do these three things with it. I guarantee you can do that today. I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to break that. I'm not going to ask you to build an application 
register it in the uh, Apple Store, go through all that pain and anguish, and six months later change the interface and make it do it again. All right, and that's my guarantee to you. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to improve my service. It doesn't need a version. Versioning breaks my design. The, the root word of versioning is to turn, right? It's to turn into something else. Extending is a different story. I can extend in lots of ways. I can add fields. I can move them. I can add affordances. I can change workflow. I can extend in lots of ways without breaking existing things. There's a lot to talk about in that area, but you need to think about for a minute. Just imagine if there were no versions. I almost used John Lennon, but I didn't. So this is another one. Skeptical fry is skeptical. You're telling me this is not restful? I'm not so sure about that, right? You could spend all day on this topic, right? Do you really want to know if this is restful? Well, I get kind of hard to about this thing. Is that what you're really asking me? If it matches some guy's list of items in a 12-year-old dissertation that he was just trying to finish so he could get his PhD out? <laughs> is that what you want to know? That he's already admitted to you that sections are missing? <laughs> or do you want to know if this is really going to work? If this is appropriate for the task at hand? It turns out, discovering if it's restful or not is a whole lot easier. Right? Is this rest? And usually the answer is no. Right? Because we don't do all of the things that Roy invented. Who's read chapter 6 in the dissertation? Chapter 6 is why HTTP is not restful. The things that don't work, the things that are mismatched, right? So good luck on them. It's a lot more interesting to ask if this is the appropriate architecture for the problem at hand. First world problem lady. Why do you make me download an SDK to use your HTTP API? I, I'm glad to say that I don't see this that much anymore. <laughs> But it used to be that you could not use my HTTP API until you downloaded the SDK that matched my language. Right? I had to download that thing, and I had to run that, and I had to code against that. That's crazy. <laughs> SDKs are a great way to control. Right? Think about it on the level of control. If, if I control all the servers and all the clients and all the coders, source is how I control how things work. Right? And I govern the source, and you check the source in, and I make sure the source is right. If I control the servers, but I don't control the clients anymore, and I still want to have a lot of control, I'll issue an SDK. You have to use my SDK. This is your ticket in. And, I, and actually, I will, if I'm very concerned about it, I will make all sorts of non-standard things go on in that SDK about the way authentication works and header signing and everything else. So it's a total pain in the ass for you to do anything but use my SDK. Now I have more control of you. The problem is, as you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you can't control all that. You can't have all the versions. You can have an SDK for every possible language. You have to change your locus of control. So almost all the time, that next level of locus of control is the message. I can control the media type. I can control the media type design. I can control the affordances that I put into the media type at runtime. There are lots of ways that I can influence what people do, but eventually, if you're on the web and on the world, you have to give up this notion of people doing what you tell them. If the chair's in the room, do I have to sit in it? Hell no, I'm leaving the room. That doesn't mean I'm not going to put a chair out. Do you really want a, a high level of control when you write your applications, or do you want people to have creativity to decide what they want to do, to use things in a new and inventive way? Donald Norman has a comment, a well-designed object is one that has affordances such that users find new ways to use the object, ways in which the designer never intended or never imagined. That's a beautiful object, right? And we've seen this. We've had this experience. Oh my gosh, I never thought you could do that with this API. I never even thought you could do that with my software. I'm amazed at the things that you're doing. That's because they have the chance to be creative. How much control do you want to have over them? Tozaki's guy, I don't design media types often, but when I do, I use hypermedia. If you're going to go through the pain and anguish of creating a custom type and trying to convince people to use it and create a shared understanding among people, I advise you to concentrate on the hypermedia aspect of it. Hypermedia is how we inform people about what you can do. 
I can exude data, raw data, in any format, XML, CSV, JSON, curly braces, angle bracket, it doesn't matter, right? If I'm gonna go through the process of actually crafting a, a media type design, what I'm gonna be adding is, is what this stuff means and what you can do with it. What you can do with it is, is the most interesting stuff. And it's the stuff we rarely talk about doing. Use media types to, to express the possible interactions with the service. Encourage clients to become interaction specialists. I know what this affordance means. I know what this form means. I know what this link means. I know what happens when it when they when the angle bracket right, it says angle bracket right. I know what that means now. If I see that, I can tell the user or I can tell the machine. This is what you do. These are the arguments. This is what you can do next. Messages that tell people what they can do. Yes. I have a hard question. You have a hard question? Can you tell me what the difference is between an interaction model and a protocol? Yeah. So the interaction model, for me, the interaction model exists within the space of this media type design. You could use it for lots of different protocols. Like HTTP is a protocol. So I can have an, HTTP, an interaction model. I can have a hypermedia document that's delivered over FTP. I can have it delivered to XMPP, HTTP. Those aren't protocols, right? Can my interaction model span across media types? Like, not media type, I can say, well, if you have a link for like HTML that says that we have a style sheet, it goes to CSS, right? That yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so interaction model is not a containing idea, right? What I'm really trying to express here is that notion that inside the message are things you can do and that clients learn to look for things they can do. They're not even looking for names, right? I don't care what the name on this rel is. I want to know what this, what this thing that I can do is. That I can post data. That's what I can do. The meaning is different. I'm not talking about meaning. I'm talking about what I can do. And that's really all I'm talking about when I say interaction. That's what I mean to say. So you have the possibility of doing that. I already talked about this one, test for each guy. Yes. You ask me to look at your RESTful API, and all I see is a list of URLs. It's not REST. It's cool, it's good, it may be exactly appropriate, but it's just an RPC list of functions and arguments. I say just. That's okay, but if you ask if you ask me to look at your, your RPC architecture, I won't flip my desk, right? I'll say, yeah, that's very cool. Actually, I like what you're doing here. I like the way you're using bodies as variable arguments and so on and so forth. But that's not REST. So very often I see that. This is a real problem, this is a real challenge still. And the, where I see it most often right now is in documentation. Because right now the only way we know how to reasonably document web HTTP interactions is through a list of URIs. I don't know how to document the interaction model I just invented. I don't know how to document the applying the problem domain to a hypermedia type yet. Yes? Are you talking like the state machine description of No, in this case here, what I'm talking about no, like your interaction model. What I'm talking about interaction model is so here's here's some things that I've done in the past. So what I do is I design a series of affordances. I go to use cases, use actors, go to use cases and I say Okay, they need to be able to upload this, they need to be able to write this, they need to be able to change the status of this, they need to be able to find this, they will search this. Every one of those is an affordance. Right? So that's like a unit. If it's UML, you can put it in a little box here, right? You can put arguments on it. And then I design a media type or locate a media type that lets me encapsulate all those interactions in, in messages. This is the one to let you search, this is the one to let you add, this is the one to let you find, this is the one to let you register, this is the one to so these are all interactions, right? So that's what I'm talking about, and I don't know right now how to document that one. And document it in a way that clients can focus on it. So do you really want to treat URIs as RPC space? You can do that. HTTP supports that, but actually it kind of sucks at it because URIs to HTTP are opaque and transient. They're not permanent identifiers. The guys in the RDF semantic web community have a different view of that. They're not in the rest world, and they have a very valid place to be. And they use, they use those identifiers as permanent names. You have to decide that. Okay, so this is one that bugs me, confession bear. 
All right, I confess that when I write my client apps, I always ignore cash and directives. Because I can't be ours to do that. It's just too much trouble. You know what? You stink. Because the internet is like some cooperative agreement here, right? And the agreement is if I tell you not to ask me for this thing again for a week, do not ask me again for a week. And do not write some iOS app out there that tens of thousands of people are going to use that does not ask, that keeps asking me over and over and over again and doesn't honor my cash and directives. So a lot of times this is because client-side tooling is weak in this area. We don't have good client-side tools that makes this the easy path for developers. That's a bad thing. Anybody who's building client-side tools, you know, take a hand. Make that easy. And I've seen some of it done. A brilliant, a brilliant item inside um, the Windows operating system is you can hook into their entire caching model with one call. You can simply, in the start of your built application on uh, .NET, it doesn't matter if it's a web application or if it's a client application, you know, like a, you know, outside the web. You click into the WinINet cache and you're done. You get all of the benefits. It's smart enough to talk all of that talk about HTTP headers and 304 and all that stuff. So it's there. So don't code clients that ignore caching because you're hurting us all. And then finally, guy yeah, was running for mayor in the New York City. Who, who knew this? Too damn high guy, right? So this was great. I love this guy. Uh, so this is a guy that basically got into the mayor's race to just keep saying, that the rent is too damn high. It was his only platform. And he became the, like this popular character. He showed up on debates, right? He would show up on debates for mayor. And all he would say is the rent is too damn high. <laughs> Turns out he was in rent controlled property and it's like it was a weird thing. But the point I'm trying to make here is I, have, I know a lot of these same characters that tell me the cost in time and effort of making a volatile lab is too damn high and they walk off the stage. It's not enough. Have you really thought about what the cost and, and effort is to write an evolvable app? Have you thought about the cost and effort to not write an evolvable app yet? This is a rich man's problem. Yeah, this, this could be a rich man's problem. So one of the challenges is often people just need to get something out and they hope they have that problem. And then the version breaking and the evolution comes in later. And I think we're starting to see a lot of that as APIs are becoming more tempted and more successful. Uh, yeah, I, I, whether or not this is the right thing to do from the very beginning when you scratch your edge, uh, mileage may vary. Once, so, you, once you start getting clients and money and you've got transactions going through, yeah. then. So uh, that, that's, certainly a, that's certainly a point of view. So it sounds to me like you've thought carefully about what it costs not to do it. Yeah. And it's worth it to not do it, right? And that's okay if you, if you go through that cost mile and you figure out, I can afford to break these things for a while. And I know who I'm breaking, and I know how they'll react, right? And that's fine. I know a lot of people who aren't thinking about this. <coughs> there, and I think we are seeing pressure on this topic primarily because we're getting so many more device deployments. You know, the mobile space is, is increasing this problem. If we all continue to just write a scriptable browsers, then we'd be done with this problem. Because code on demand solves every problem. It does, right? I can actually, because that's what Google does, right? Is they create, a, they create an HTML frame with, with two divs in it and leads, you know, and a link to like six megs of JavaScript. That's a totally evolvable application. Yeah, except they have to do the speed. Well, yes, I mean, yes, but, you know, they can do that. But a lot of us don't have that case, right? Make sure you really assess the cost and benefits. And make sure you assess the cost of not doing it. And make a smart decision. Not creating an evolvable app is not a bad thing. Creating the wrong level of evolvability is going to cause you problems. Like if you make it overly evolvable, it's going to cost too much and then people aren't going to like it. You're going to have problems with adoption. Just like deciding if, if the technology is appropriate. Okay? Now, for the most part, in my experience, this is not that hard. This is not that hard at all. We can talk some more about it. So, 
I took this took a little longer than I should because because I started late. But these are the twelve that I outlined here today, and the point of this is to just get you to think. We all recognize these characters. We recognize these problems. Some of them have rather simple solutions, like please cash. Some of them have very, very complicated solutions, like figuring out the cost of availability, right? But they're there, and they should, be, they should be in your mind when you tell clients how to build applications, when you lead developers into creating systems, when you tell people how to build frameworks and tools. Keep these things in mind, and we'll all be better off. And what's most important is if you think about it, Who's read the um, opening quote in the introduction of Fielding's thesis? Who can remember what that is? What is it? Do you I don't remember it. I've read it. Does anybody remember it? It's a, it's a question. Yeah, I do remember it. Did you say knives? Does anybody know that reference? Yeah. Monty Python, the architect sketch. Fielding wrote his dissertation because he was pissed because people applied the wrong technology to a problem based on fadism rather than careful evaluation. And he links to a Monty Python sketch where they want to build a block of apartments. And this guy comes in and he's just totally excited about his apartments. He's explaining everything. It's like soundproof walls. He's got beautiful for you. He has beautiful pictures on the wall. And then right at the very end, there's the knives. And then there's these big, long sluices. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Did you say knives? He said, oh, yes. Do you? plan on killing our apartment attendants? He said, yes, yes. I build abattoirs. I build slaughterhouses. This is the best slaughterhouse ever. And he said, did you not want to do that? I said, no. I said, well, then I've completely misunderstood your approach to tenants. <laughs> this guy knows one thing and one thing well. He got the opportunity to build something, and he built what he knew, whether they needed it or not, whether it hurt people or not. And he got really pissed that they didn't like it. He built them this beautiful thing, and they hated it. This is the first quote in Fielding's thesis. Watch the sketch. We do not want to be that guy, right, who does what we want to do even though it's inappropriate, even though it hurts people, even though it pisses people off. Right? We want to pay attention, right? And that's what Fielding tried to give us. The poor guy spent pages and pages describing how you could create your own style based on properties and constraints. Then to prove that it's possible, he gave us one chapter as one example, and that's all we care about now, is the one example. So we're not even doing what Fielding asked, and he's pissed. So if you read chapter two and three, you read about what he was really asking, what he was really suggesting how you can design your appropriate architecture, and how you can not be one of these memes. Thank you. All right, let's take a, let's take a short break, and then we'll start the five and five. So we'll take about a 10 minute break. We'll start about five or 10 minutes, okay? And I'd be happy to, you know,